I first want to thank Yeo and Sheen for organizing this and Caverly Carey for taking care of the logistics so well and the museum community both in Berkeley and San Francisco for welcoming us so warmly and teaching us so much. This paper examines a crucial but relatively underexplored chapter in the history of 20th century Shanghai, the early Republican years between the fall of the Qing Dynasty in late 1911 and the May 4th Movement of 1919. New visual genres were formed, if not yet labeled in this period, and the new visual economy was dominated by the fast developing but still non-institutionalized field of commercial art. This was also a formative <laughs> stage in the visual depiction of women, not so much of courtesans whose photographs had graced the pages of the tabloid press and the covers of fiction magazines from the late Qing, but Shanghai's nubile daughters of good families, upright young wives, and devoted educators. For the first time in Chinese history, these women whose forebears had been almost uniformly rendered as delicate, long-suffering exemplar types were depicted as dynamic and captivating individuals. As the turn of the 20th century witnessed an unprecedented explosion of popular visual media, often featuring women from pictorials to photographs to film, it also gave rise to a new ontology of female vision. Not only were women represented and seen differently, they were newly and actively engaged in the act of seeing. My focus for this investigation is Funu Shibao, which was published in Shanghai from June of 1911 to April of 1917. China's first commercial gender journal, Funu Shibao, provides unique insights into the narrative of early Republican Shanghai. It was one of the only journals and the longest lived to straddle the 1911 divide and to survive the scrutiny of Yuan Shikai censors. Most importantly for our focus on the visual, the journal was founded by a cultural entrepreneur, Di Bao Shen, who in addition to publishing the highly successful Shanghai daily newspaper, Shi Bao, was committed to using the most current reproductive technologies to preserve China's artistic cultural heritage. The remarkable images that ultimately appeared in the journal were the product of the journal's close affiliation with two of Di's other publishing ventures. In addition to photographing ancient calligraphy and renowned paintings, Di's Youjiang Shuju was equipped to present Funu Shibao's national audience with an unprecedented range and quality of visual images. These images include some 485 photographs, which appeared in the first five to 10 pages of the journal's 21 issues and provide rich insights into Shanghai's visual culture. In my presentation today, however, I'll focus on the foremost paratextual feature of the Funu Shibao that readers encountered even before they turned to the photographs, the cover images. Intriguing portraits of the kinds of women the Funu Shibao editors were committed to calling into being, these cover illustrations invited readers into the journal and into its unique vision of the Shanghai imaginary. I'll analyze two aspects of the cover portraits. First, their promotion of a new ontology of female vision, and second, their depiction of a range of activities in which idealized women of Shanghai would engage in. Before turning to the images themselves, however, it's important to know something about the artists who created Shanghai's first magazine cover girls. Two late Qing and early Republican commercial artists can be identified as the creators of the Funu Shibao covers, Xu Yongqing and Shen Chen. Neither is renowned today for his magazine cover art. In fact, none of the rather spotty biographical materials on Xu and Shen record their work for Funu Shibao. Instead, Xu is known as a pioneer in Chinese watercolor painting and pedagogy and as a calendar poster artist, and Shen as a satirical cartoonist. The process Xu and Shen used to create the covers was, I speculate, color lithography, and I hope to get enlightened on this. Um, by some of you who know more about these processes than I do. A socially disadvantaged but talented young man, Xu Yongqing's upbringing and artistic formation were uniquely conditioned by what the city of Shanghai had to offer. Born into a family surnamed Fan in Songjiang, Jiangsu, but soon orphaned, Xu was brought up in the Jesuit orphanage of St. Ignatius Cathedral, a French religious establishment. He was given an unusual set of life skills in the cathedral's artistic workshop, the Tushan Wan Art Studio. 
He was trained from the age of 19, when, and that was the year 1893, in Western painting techniques, specifically oil painting and watercolor. He thus first learned to paint the human form by copying depictions of biblical religious figures. And this is a photograph from Tushan Wan. This reliance on Western models continued throughout his career. He would develop his own painting techniques by imitating famous British and French watercolorists. And when he was commissioned to illustrate textbooks, he made a copy book out of pictures ripped out of foreign magazines, which he purchased in a secondhand store um, somewhere in the Beijing Road area. When Xu left Tushan Wan in 1898 at the age of 24, as just suggested, he began his career as an illustrator of new style media, including textbooks and organs of the periodical press. The latter included Funu Shibao. He definitively designed the cover of the Funu Shibao's fourth issue in November of 1911, and I hypothesize he was also responsible for the covers of issues one to three. His artistry, which was evinced in these covers and in other illustrations, came to the attention of editors of the commercial press, who invited Xu to head their art department in 1912 or 1913. In 1915, following disagreements between the publishing house's art department and editorial staff, he left commercial and returned to illustrating newspapers and magazines full time. He had contributed cover art for the Funa Shabao while still employed. At the press, however, his signature appears on four covers from late 1913 through early 1915, and I believe he's responsible for a couple of others that don't have his signature. His covers reflect his Western training at Xu Jiahui and his particular talent for landscape painting. His adept use of perspective characteristic of Western watercolor and oil paintings made his scenery more vivid and realistic than more symbolic renderings of nature in traditional Chinese painting. His human figures were less successful. Ellen Johnston Lang has called them barely competent, perhaps because his figure painting training had been limited to copying religious icons. In contrast, Shen Bao Chen excelled at rendering the human figure, and particularly in painting modern beauties. He created a series of representations of such women entitled Xin Xin Bai Mei Tu, New New Pictures of 100 Beauties, which was first serialized in a newspaper and then published in book form in 1913. In compiling this album, Shen continued a long-standing Chinese tradition, which we have just heard um, a little bit about from Lisa, of representing beauties, Mei Ren or Bai Mei. At the same time, he infused this highly conventionalized genre with an unprecedented energy and elan. He also replaced the decontextualized generic beauties of the past with women situated in and identified with a specific spatio-temporal um, context, and that is early Republican Shanghai. As early as the 1890s, Wu Youru had already created a pantheon of modern Shanghai beauties, and some of these are on display um, at the Asian Art Museum, the Haishang Baiyan Tu. Within two decades, Wu's tiny-footed ladies of the boudoir in their voluminous layered jackets and pants were replaced by Shen Bao Chen's and Ding Song's, who I'll talk about in a moment, women with natural feet in outdoor settings, sporting short, tight jackets with short, tight sleeves and short, tight pants. Two of the most influential chroniclers and creators of this new Shanghai look, Shen and Ding Song, were close friends and colleagues whose career trajectories ran closely parallel to one another. Shen, whose poor health made it difficult for him to complete his studies, was largely self-taught as an artist. Shortly after moving from his native Tongxiang in Zhejiang province to work in a silk shop in Shanghai in 1909, he left the business to learn traditional painting from a minor artist. Ding was also from Zhejiang, but from Jiashan, and studied Western painting in Shanghai with the painter Zhou Xiang before going on to teach sketching himself. While both men created albums of modern Shanghai beauties, they were each ultimately best known for their often politically sensitive satirical cartoons. Shen published more than a thousand cartoons in a range of newspapers and pictorials in the 1910s before creating his own Shanghai Puck in 1918. Ding published some 500 satirical cartoons in various newspapers and in 1924 was one of the co-founders of a cartoon um, society. Both men also created cover mm -hmm. illustrations for early Republican periodicals, Shen for Funu Shibao and Ding for the fiction magazine Li Bai Liu. The, 
The convergence of styles and themes in Shannon Ding's depictions of women is striking. Three of Funishabao's covers bear Shen's signature, and I believe he was responsible for at least 10 of the 21 covers in all. Many of Shen's images resonate with illustrations Ding published in his Shanghai Shizhuang Tuyong, his uh, 100 Beauties book, in both style and content. As this last image of the woman with binoculars suggests, the Funu Shibao covers, covers represent a new ontology of female vision, a new bodily experience of being both viewer and viewed, and a new mode of female engagement in the act of seeing. Unlike Mayren of the past or cover girls of the future, the subjects of the journal covers are actively looking rather than posing to be looked at. And unlike contemporaneous courtesans or later gl glamour girls, they are preoccupied with activities, objects, and sightings within their own sphere of vision, rather than with catching the attention of the viewer. This new ontology of vision is closely linked to the editorial mission of the journal, which was to call a new kind of early Republican woman into being. As Bao Tian Shao, the lead editor of the journal, asserted, this mission entailed a shift in the spatial and visual matrix of gender relations in early 20th century Shanghai. In his editorial column, he relentlessly begged members of his intended audience of Republican ladies to go public with their words and with their images. He pleaded with women to send in their own discursive writings and to accompany their submissions with personal photographs. He wanted his female readers and writers to know one another not only by reading one another, but by seeing one another. Xu Yongqing and Shen Bao Chen visually depicted women engaged in this new, more dialectical, visual economy. They represented respectable, dynamic, and fashionable women, not as objects of the male gaze, but as seeing as well as seen subjects. In so doing, they invited women to be empowered by their own eyes and unabashed by their presence in the modern visual field. Two of the most powerful images, examples of this new mode of seeing are self-reflexive images of women on the covers of Funu Shirbao, viewing women on the covers of Funu Shirbao. On the cover of the first issue, two young students look at their own image on the cover of the first issue. The 13th cover depicts an older woman viewing a series of magazine covers, including the cover, covers of recent issues of Funu Shibao. If you look at them very closely, you can see this, in a public display, probably somewhere in the bookshop district of Shanghai. A second cluster of cover images depicts women looking at distant horizons from various vantage points, both outside and inside, the landscape beckons from the window even as a woman knits. The woman's viewing eyes are enhanced by visual apparatus like binocul binoculars that make remote vistas more accessible and the camera, which makes the natural landscape appropriable. Finally, in a handful of covers, women look not at themselves or into the distance, but at the viewer. They are not, however, wilting objects of the viewer's gaze with demurely lowered eyes nor do they appear awkwardly self-conscious as do women in leeching depictions of early female encounters with the camera. Rather, the cover girls seem to have been momentarily interrupted from another engaging activity, whether walking to school, walking the dog, or removing one's gloves. The sense of women being unselfconsciously involved in a range of activities permeates the covers. A number of them represent women reading, an older woman peruses a newspaper in a calm country setting. A younger woman has fallen asleep over an illustrated book, which the rose at her side and her fashionable dress suggest is a piece of romantic fiction. A young mother reads a text the size of Funu Shibao to her, either to her toddler age son or with him as he holds the text in his hand. A group of covers depict women engaged in new activities in often pastoral settings, removed from the realities of Shanghai. The cover girls play tennis with what looks like a Western-style country estate in the background. They hunt in the rolling hills in strikingly hybrid attire. They use the latest photographic technology, as we've seen, to record their natural surroundings. They fish with older companions and in fashionable heels. They make use of Shanghai's modern conveniences to mail letters and to fill, buck fill buckets with running water. Not all Funu Shibao cover girls were engaged in new activities. One rural woman, 
who stands out because of her singularity, transports a basket laden with raked leaves. Another knits, but as previously noted, next to a window with the outside reality claiming most of her attention. The distinctiveness of the Funu Shabao covers and the extent to which they reflect the journal's unique editorial mission is sharply evident when we compare them with the covers for the early Funu Zajer. Also published in Shanghai, the Funu Zajer was founded by the commercial press in January of 1915, two years before Funu Shabao went out of print. The later journal's more domestically oriented agenda is reflected in the cover art to its first 12 issues. While created by the same artist as a number of the Funu Shibao covers, Xu Yongqing, uh, the Funu Zajir illustrations are profoundly different in content and tone, reflecting the plurality of Shanghai imaginaries. The women Xu depicted for the commercial press are more sedate and enclosed, more preoccupied with familiar feminine tasks than prone to self-reflection or captivated by new horizons. Their paratextual framing is also more reminiscent of earlier paintings. Each image is accompanied by a four-character description of the woman's activities in dense classical Chinese. At the same time, Xu's signature, which appears in both romanization and in characters on the Funu Shibao covers, appears only in characters on the covers of Funu Zajer. Two of the 12 Funu Zajer women are engaged in new pastimes or occupations, one paints in her studio with a Western clock on the wall. Another is dressed in a Western nurse's uniform. All of the other women perform typical feminine activities. While the young reader on the first cover appears to be a school student, she is not strolling in public like her Funu Shabao counterparts. As the caption explains, she is practicing refined lessons in the inner chambers. Her four walls are those of the boudoir, not the classroom. The woman depicted knitting on the 10th cover of Funu Shubao, as I said previously, is more engaged with the scene outside the window than with her handwork. Her corollary in the Funu Zajer series, in contrast, listlessly twists wool with her back rather than her face to the window. Most of the women like this one are indoors, embroidering, spinning late into the night, cooking in the kitchen, making clothing, or weaving by lamplight. Those women who are outdoors also perform conventional womanly work. They cultivate mulberry leaves in silkworm months, pick tea leaves before the rain, or wash clothing in the spring river. Even when these women take a moment to turn their eyes to the horizon, as so many in Funu Shabao do, they look at birds rather than airplanes, and with the naked eye rather than through binoculars. In the late 1910s, the Funu Shibao cover girls thus evoked a broader range of possible experiences for Shanghai women than did their Funu Zajer counterparts. By the late 1920s and 30s, however, the Funu Shibao figures would themselves appear outmoded in comparison with the photogenic, glamorous, and inviting woman on the covers of journals like Liang Yu Hua Bao. And again, there's at least one cover um, from this journal in the um, exhibit in San Francisco. And Lin Long. These Republican Shanghai cover girls were in turn joined and soon superseded in 1939 by new, more ideologically strident models of womanhood who appeared on the covers of Zhongguo Funu. Launched in Yan'an, this journal would remain the mouthpiece of the Fulian, the All China Women's Federation, up through today. For the first four decades of its publishing history, the Zhongguo Funu covers resonated most with the one outlier among the Funu Shibao covers the agricultural laborer. Unlike the majority of the Funu Zajer figures, Zhonghua Funu cover girls were always depicted outside, hoeing, lifting, laboring. They no longer imagined flight, but parachuted from the skies themselves. They did not tote guns on leisurely hunting jots, but learned to use them to more pragmatic ends. The next dramatic change in the representation of Chinese cover girls, which predictably followed the end of the Cultural Revolution, emerged in the early 1980s as entertainers and glamour girls replaced the laborers and iron girls of the first communist decades. And this is the same Zhongguo Funu journal. With China's embrace of international commercialization and the ascendancy of an increasingly de-ethnicized global glitz, the intriguing hybridity and ocular dynamism that defined Shanghai's first wave of commercial culture has been all but erased from visual memory. <laughs> 